So first thing uh, I wanted to ask you was, Earl, first give us your name, uh, full name, Simon, Simon Jones, Cav. It's not Cav uh, Jones. Simon Jones, yeah, is my actual name. Um, that's just a bit of my surname. I just use that on social sometimes so people can't find me. Oh, oh cool. Well, I'm glad that you just said it on this podcast, so now everybody knows how to find you. Uh, <laughs> w- w- welcome to Raisin Bread, Simon. Definitely not Cav Jones. Uh, welcome to Raisin Bread, everybody. This is Basil. You, as you'll notice, Ben is not in today. Instead, we've got the beautiful, um, uh, so some might even say celestial, Derek Smith joining us today. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for being back. Glad to be back. I am so happy to have you here, Derek. You have no idea. Uh, if you guys don't know much, uh, Derek is a, an amazing comedian. Um, he's going to be helping me co-host uh, for a little while while, while Ben's away. So, uh, And with that said, welcome to the show, Simon. Uh, Simon, this is how I explained you to the the, uh, the entire team. Um, I said, uh, some wealthy crypto dude that gets really good seats at boxing matches. That's all I know. <laughs> That's all I know about this guy. I, oh, I, I think he had dinner with Katie. I think he had dinner with Katie Perry once. I wasn't really sure. That's it. That's all I know um, about this guy. I so. did have to you <laughs> In the in the Bahamas at Crypto Bahamas, the now infamous Crypto Bahamas, organized by a certain fuzzy haired guy. Yeah, which fuzzy haired guy, Simon? Uh, I, think, I think his first name was Sam, from memory. Uh, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, if you come across him, you might have read a little bit about him. A successful crypto entrepreneur. Is he into fried? Still successful. <laughs> <laughs> Right. He's, That's a good um, I mean, he's, he's certainly been spending a lot of time with the authorities recently. Yeah. You know, did you did you meet him? What was that? Were you there? Like, were you, was he there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've met Sam a couple of times. Um, uh, strange guy. You know, like, um, I would describe him as, you know, it's going to be a way, like, they're just so different to a normal person. And you kind of attribute that as probably part of their kind of you know autistic math genius or something. <laughs> but in reality, it turned out that he was just a crook, um, <laughs> and it was a front. Um, but now I've, I've met Sam a few times. I've spoken to Sam a few times on calls and stuff. So yeah, um, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily claim him as one of my closest right now, but um, I certainly have. <laughs> <interacted> <laughs> You guys, are you saying you're you're not close? Is that what? Why would you even say that? Uh, I have no idea why you would take that position at all. Uh, no, that make that makes total sense. I'm, I mean, what, I I've heard that from a lot of people. People are like, oh, well, I just thought he was autistic, so it's fine. Uh, but was is he really? Do you really think he's is like suffers from some sort of social? I mean, he's an MIT kid. Well, where did you go to school? You're you're an Oxbridge guy, right? No, I was at LSE, um, Black School of Economics. Same thing. You know what I mean. All you, all y'all are weirdos, right? Like, if I go to Cambridge, it's mostly weirdos. If I go to the math department, anyways. So, yeah, that's... so you got you probably were like, oh yeah, I'm very comfortable here. I know what this is. <laughs> no, I just or, or, or was it not? Fair enough. No, it's fair. just work. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where, like, yeah, you know, when you when you work in an industry, and yeah, you know, he he was. A fairly integral part of the crypto world, right? You know, between FTX and Alameda. I mean, there were so many different things that he was involved in that he funded. You know, he was right. Yeah, you, know, you couldn't say like totemic, right? You know, lots of things rotated around the sample. So if you worked in the industry, right. really, you, you were pretty likely to come into contact with him or certainly want contact with him because, you know, he was a guy who made things happen. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, clearly he took that through into his fraud as well. I mean, he you know, made a pretty good job, a large scale fraud. <laughs> he said he's an undercooking, right? <laughs> good, good, good job on the good job on the fraud, Simon. Uh, 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 Sam says Simon Jones. That'll be the clip. <laughs> <laughs> the old, the old time, yeah. go big, go, go big or go home, right? I think you definitely took that one to heart. Um, 
but uh, yeah. but no, in, all, in all seriousness, you know, it was uh, it was pretty bad. I don't think anybody really saw it coming because obviously people knew how successful certain things had been involved with had been. So you know, I, I think whilst people may have suspected there could have been mistakes along the way of growing a business in the way that he did and that quickly. I don't think anybody suspected that, you know, he was stealing $12 billion to uh, keep the show on the road. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Any time yes. billion? $12 billion, yeah. bro. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. No, I just knew it was a lot. It was, I knew that it was an amount of money that made it so that everybody knew that he stole money. We're <laughs> in an industry where people steal money. He got <laughs> to be the biggest. I just didn't know what, it, what that number was. Yeah, 12, bi- 12 billion. Wow. 12, Twelve billion dollars of customers' funds. Um, so yeah, Jesus it's uh, I know. Oh. Yeah, ouch. <laughs> I really wish Ben was here this episode because he lost he lost money in, in FTX. He lost I think about like five grand. And, and, uh, and I, I, okay. Go on. I, I lost I lost some money too, so you know, we we're certainly on the same list there. Yeah, but but no no one feels bad for you, Simon. Let's let's be honest <laughs> with that. With your posh accent, and any Englishman who's listening to this is like, he'll be fine. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> I feel bad for you because I like you, but uh, you know, the the boys down in Birmingham or Birmingham, they're not. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna shed a tear for you. Absolutely, so. I, I must say, I did. I did fail to shed a tear the other week. I had dinner with a guy I know down in Portugal who uh, picked me up and took me from my hotel to dinner in his Ferrari eight or two super fast and. Over dinner, told me that he'd lost 110 million dollars in the FTX collapse. Um, Holy, yeah, wow. So, like, how what percent 110 million? It's like absolutely nothing compared to the 12 billion, right? Is yeah. that like 0.1 yeah. percent? One percent? Oh, what, yeah, what is it? One percent, yeah, <laughs> say, <laughs> but uh, yeah, oh my god, that's a lot. That's oh, a yeah. lot, that is huge. How did he? What was he like? How did he feel about it? Um, but this way, I mean, or what did he seem like? Yeah, no, I mean, it's money that he had that he lost. So you know, he's he's still alive, but obviously he's not uh, not happy. That's for sure. You know, I think that you'd have to be a certain spectrum of wealth where you could afford to lose one hundred and ten million dollars and not notice it. <laughs> I don't think he's there yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what level of I feel like I I feel like even at a billion dollars I'd be like, hey, where did that hey guys, where did the 110 million I put go? You know? Abs- yeah. Absolutely. You know, yeah. <laughs> like I've washed money in my pants before. Right. And like or you know, one time I left money on a table and it was gone. But it was twenty five dollars, and it ruined me for a day. <laughs> yeah, it's not. I feel like one hundred and ten million is not just pocket change. Uh, but uh, but you know you know you you live in a different world than me. That's 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 for sure. Uh, I I'll ask you. I guess you know with with the, with the recent drop in. Um, <laughs> I said I did until the recent FT. I said I did until the FTX collapse, and now now we're all equal. <laughs> no, I'm joking. That's right. But yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, I'm wondering with this recent drop from in crypto, uh, you know, from here on out, where where do you see where do you see things going? Like, will, will crypto still keep growing, or, or what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I think it, to me, I mean. I think it's a natural correction mode right now, right? I, I think, you know, there's certainly factors like, you know, FTX, Celsius, Voyager, Galaxy, et cetera, blowing up that have, you know, precipitated the market movements. But to some extent, I think- For you know, people who don't know who those are, what, what are those, those Voyager, Genesis, Galaxy, et cetera? Some of the leading kind of crypto borrowing and lending platforms. Um, so you might have seen the stuff recently with the Lincoln Boss twins uh, of uh, not founding Facebook fame, uh, having a go at Digital Currency Group, who own Genesis, which has filed today, I believe, for insolvency. Yep. Um, 
And, you know, basically, I think from kind of June onwards last year, you had a kind of series of disruptions in the market where people who everyone assumed were really smart, uh, like Three Arrows Capital, um, you know, basically weren't very smart and lost billions of dollars with market corrections. And, um, but I think to some extent, I, I actually think that the current situation we're in is that it's healthy because there was a period of time where any project that had kind of crypto, NFT, you know, Web3 gaming, any of these different kind of buzzwords, people just throw millions of dollars at it, right? You know, you could come up with a deck for the most useless concept in history. The right <laughs> buzzword. Raised $20 million and then, uh, you know, gone and partied for the next two years, which is what a lot of those projects do. Um, so I think now we can't do that anymore. No, not as much. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so now I think, yeah, but what we've seen in that time actually is some pretty big infrastructure jumps, right? Yeah. The actual underlying infrastructure mm -hmm. of blockchain, you know, what's known as a layer one. So, you know, for people listening at home, a good example of a layer one would be, it's like Ethereum, right? Uh, which most people will have heard of or Solana or Nia or you know, any of those kind of platforms where those things have been massively developed. A lot of the infrastructure around them has been developed and that wouldn't have been possible without the last run in the market. But I think what you're going to see now is probably kind of a, a, a 12 month period where you get a bit of thinning in the market, meaning so you know, I think probably about 30% of all crypto and NFT projects will effectively just if they don't die in the next 12 months, they will just devalue so much that they're not really worth being there anymore. But a lot of the stuff that right. should have gone to die will go to die. Um, and hopefully it's a good lesson for VCs in this world that just throwing money at something that they think is hot and encouraging people to go out and build it uh, is actually a bad idea if there's no actual demand or no actual utility for it. Um, I was reading the tweets of a certain leading fund manager who's down only 90% this year or last year, sorry. Um, earlier. Can you say that? Yeah, Multicoin. Um, oh, well, they think the next, okay. yeah, yeah. they think the next big, big thing is web three fashion. And you think to yourself, well, even I don't know really what that means. Um, what is web three fashion? <laughs> you know, am I going to wear an NFT to go out for dinner? Right. I mean, Right. Yeah, you know, what what's the actual right. use case stuff, right? So get, I get I a think Gucci more... bag for your for your kids Roblox character, or I guess I, exactly. I don't know. I, I... Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, for the wife and kids who don't have those, <laughs> <laughs> now you can just pretend like you have a Gucci bag. And just to explain to you, Derek, so Roblox is this video okay. game, uh, uh, yeah. and apparently, yeah. No, it's, it's kind of scary. You can scam people on it. <laughs> I mean, you probably could, uh, but uh, you know, you can. You can. Uh, you know that. Yeah, I How mean, yeah. There are some ways that you can you can get into Roblox and scam people. I've I've listened to some inf interesting <laughs> ideas of doing that. <laughs> you can scam people with anything, right? If you can get a layer between you and them, <laughs> then you can take their money. Well, well that, I mean, that's dollars back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no uh it's 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 rough it's rough uh for in the i uh, thank god i didn't put any money in ftx like um uh, man i i i Me too I, i'm <laughs> yeah i uh i bought all my bitcoin uh the old-fashioned way uh yeah i don't know you know it's it's interesting because like some people don't really understand how much money we're talking about, right? Like it's just sitting there growing, mm -hmm. you know, it, or is it just sitting there growing or can folks, can the lay, lay person even actually access it? Like when you sit, talk to mm -hmm. me about Web3 fashion, like, like you, right? This is kind of a nebulous concept to me. How does a normal person access that? Much like many other things in crypto. Absolutely. Or can yeah, they? I agree. Um, I mean, they can, but, you know, 
I think that the um, the reality of it is the model really for all this stuff has been you know, hype, right? It's been hype it up, get enough people interested, get people to buy in. And if you look at so many of these projects that you know are now falling by the wayside, it's it's generally been quite an interesting trend that what you get is kind of you know Western rich investors buying in very cheaply, pumping it up. And then, you know, when it goes to sell down and they pull their money out, the people left holding the baby are generally either retail investors uh, or people who are kind of completely disconnected from the markets, right? That's what's happened with a lot of learn and earn platforms, you know, kind of, you know, VC from LA makes millions, kid in, you know, Thailand loses half his life savings, right? And that's kind of not cool, really. Ah, uh, it's not cool. It's interesting that, you know, talking about FTX, I had lunch back in December with in Boston uh, with a guy called Sam Reed. Um, Sam's the co-founder of BitMEX, which was one of the original exchanges. And uh, really nice yeah, guy. Yeah. Really nice guy, actually, Sam. And um, he said to me something really interesting, which was, never trust an exchange that wasn't built by anyone who traded on Mt. Gox, right? So for anybody who doesn't know what Mt. Gox, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, it was one of yeah, the what is Mt. Gox? Mt. Gox is one of the original crypto exchanges and it went bust okay. years ago because what happened was that they were they'd left a back door in their system so their hot wallets i.e. exchange wallets where people sent funds to were being slowly drained so people were just taking okay. tokens out of it right and he was like generally if you look at the history of exchanges Anybody who traded on there or had interaction with that platform learned what not to do with a crypto platform. <laughs> so if you look at yeah. what came next, you know, they were the exchanges that generally were better. Um, I think it's quite an interesting life lesson when you look at that, which is it's still such an early industry, generally. Um, there are still issues that are trying to be solved, but actually there are some points that you can design out. So like, for example, those guys, what they did was they used to process manual withdrawals, um, which meant that wherever they were, the founders in the world at one given point in time, they had made sure that two of them were always available to sign off every withdrawal. But that meant that they never lost funds and never got hacked because the obvious right. exploitation weren't there. Um, it also apparently meant that they had a vast amount of security when they're all together. But apart from that, you know, um, but I think you know, it's a good lesson, actually, because when you actually look back at you know, a lot of the things that have happened, certainly in the last, say, 12 months and you know, the names we referenced earlier. If you look back at the original kind of purpose of, of crypto and you know, read the, you know, the white paper, Shatoshi's masterwork, um, None of these things should have happened because no individual, no group of individuals should have that level of control on a project. Mm. You know, the whole idea was technology mm. designed that out. And actually, when you look at every example of blow up, right, you can really, in my mind, and you know, some people will tell me I'm talking absolute nonsense here, and most people do tell me that most of the time. But actually, in my mind, these projects weren't really crypto projects. They were projects that just happened to be in crypto, you know. Celsius was just shadow banking. There was nothing crypto about it. It was just the fact they chose to lend against crypto. FTX was a crypto exchange, but it was also a fraud in the same way that someone could do that with your bank if there was no supervision, right? <laughs> it's not a unique thing to crypto. It's just a unique thing that, you know, you get bad actors doing and they, they go into sectors like this. And you, know, you, you look at an environment like the US where they really have not worked out how to regulate this stuff at all. That you, know, you can always make an argument that governments are facilitating this because they're not telling the good actors how they can actually do things. And therefore, of course, they're not telling the bad actors what they can't do. And that creates this kind of weird paradigm. And, and, and in some cases, they're letting the bad actors uh sit in on the legislation and help shape and form the legislation that uh that that is meant to protect against the bad actors i still love those pictures of sbf on cap hill uh talking to congressmen that stuff is oh i don't know if you saw that derek but like 
I did. I didn't. I, it was actually when you said that they let bad actors sit in on legislation. It got really hard for me to follow where what <laughs> industry you were talking about, <laughs> oil or uh, tax processing. I think, is I think there's ever a record to be held for a crypto entrepreneur who spent the most time with the U.S. government. Sam may win that prize. He was but there all the I'm... time, dude. He was there all exactly. the time. But th what the frick? Every day, like there was there was a point. I don't remember. Maybe what... that was the problem. <laughs> I mean, he's not running the exchange. He's visiting <laughs> these people that don't know anything about crypto. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, it could be honest. That's. I mean, I just remember a point where I was just looking up and it was either, I don't know if it was CNBC, it was something. And I was just like, is this dude up there? Like, what is he doing? What's going on here? And I, and I never dealt with FD, FDX, um, but it was just always odd to me that that guy, like, I don't know. Uh, some, some people, I have a friend who says, never trust a man who uh, gives his money away uh, for free. I don't know if I'm that extreme, but I don't think I can trust a man who's not a congressman or a paid lobbyist who's there every single day, you know, <clears throat> for months at a time. I, I feel like that guy I can look at with some suspicion. On the topic of like things not being crypto, what what would you call these things? Like, would you call them shit coins? Or, or nah. what are your thoughts on shit coins? What would you what would you call them? I mean, I would call a lot of this stuff shadow banking slash fraud because that's what it is, right? I mean, it's not, you know, it, it, but I think in terms of shit coins, I mean, obviously, yeah, everyone loves a good shit coin. Um, I think there's a, there's a spectrum of shit coins. I mean, you've got whole coins, alt coins, and shit coins, right? There are the three right. kind of broad definitions. So your whole coins are your kind of, yeah, generally speaking, some people would argue that Bitcoin is the only whole coin. Other people would say that, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you've got your altcoins like your Salamas, your Nears, your Poly, your Matic, those kind of things, which are good. And then really, I suppose, you know, the definition of shitcoin is, 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 is really up to the, uh, to the individual user to apply. But um, I suppose probably anything outside the top couple of hundred projects could be classed as a shitcoin. Yeah, but um, the top hundred projects change every cycle. Right. Mm. So, yeah. so what do you, what, what's your, what, what, what do you think is a shit coin? Uh, BNB. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. We're taking shots. We're firing shots. BNB, <laughs> uh, Derek, is the, uh, yeah, what is that? It is the, it is the, <laughs> It's the coin associated with Binance. Uh, mm -hmm. Binance uh, is a bit suspicious. How would you classify it? But what do you think of Binance, Simon? I I find them a bit suspicious. I I concur. I think it's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to confront right now. Um, but uh, I I you know all, all I would say is that pr they put out. So when, when FTX went down, there was this big kind of rush for all other exchanges to be like, hey, you know, we're not insolvent. We have reserves. We're one for one because obviously with the exchange, if I put an asset there, it should still be there. Um, right. And I should be able to show that I don't have these ridiculous liabilities. And uh, what Binance put out basically wasn't proof of liability, um, yep. which... They must have known that. So you just wonder kind of why. And I think that's where it all all started. Um... So do you think this, okay, if you're talking about a scam, right? Uh, if somebody does that, like like the, the Nigerian prince email scam, it looks hmm. shady because they want to weed out all the people that will cause problems for them. Yeah. And, this maybe does that anybody would notice that would be like i'm not going to go there and then they can just get just the bad uh, or the low information users could be yeah i mean look, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that violence is a scam but i am saying that there's some big questions that you know i don't understand why they can't answer right and right. i think you know at the end of the day 
Um, you know, I think it all takes you down to that simple point, right? Which is, there's a very clear message in crypto, right? Not your keys, not your coins. And you'll see that repeatedly. And what that basically means is, you know, if you don't actually physically hold the asset in a place that's in your custody, yeah, and that could be in a non-custodial wallet, it could be a non-custodial mobile wallet, it could be a hardware wallet like this one I've got here, which is my ledger, which um, is a, you know, I can literally store crypto on here. Um, then, of course, you know, if, if it's not my keys, it's not my coins. So if I give somebody else my assets and their terms and conditions so that, you know, anything I send there is their property, right? Ultimately, right. you know, it's not only breaching one of the core principles of crypto, but it's also um, actually just bad practice. You know, if you want to get into crypto, the best piece of advice I can possibly give you is buy your own hardware wallet. You know, go out yep. and pick up a ledger or a Trezor device or any of the leading ones that are reasonably straightforward to set up. But then everything that you own as such is, is on this stick, right? Um, and you've got your backups to it, your seed phrases, you can access it through online linkage. Um, it's a little bit cumbersome to set up for the first time if you've not done it before. But actually, <laughs> the, the short term pain is, is, is worth it. Um, you yeah, because then basically, that's mine. I own it. <laughs> yeah. No one can yeah. take that away if your from wife, me. Yeah, if your wife uh, divorces you and uh, you, didn't, you didn't preen up heavy, or get a good estate uh, set up, uh, you can always forget your password. You know, <laughs> not that I'm giving any suggestions to anyone out there. I'm just saying she might not. Memory is a fickle thing, Simon. And uh, yeah, like, <laughs> like, did you hear about that guy though? That who like who had like a bunch of Bitcoin in the U.S. got divorced, and the authorities tried to clay, seize some of this, the the Bitcoin to give to his wife. And he was just like, I don't know. I, I forgot. I forgot the password. Uh, I have no idea. I know, I know the, my favorite one that was Michael Saylor, the um, guy from uh, micro, uh, micro strategies at micro. Yeah. Micro strategies. micro strategies. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Who said that he was it lost his Bitcoin because he had fallen, <laughs> his wallet had fallen in the <laughs> off his yacht. Uh, and therefore I think there was, there was some kind of tax implication to all of this but his bitcoin had fallen off his yacht into the sea <laughs> it just, it just, it was something like just 60 down. million dollars worth of crypto or something he claimed to have lost in the sea what's what's 60 million dollars between uh friends and the ocean you know what i mean it's absolutely it's, uh yeah it's so okay so uh, I'm get, getting this not this like understanding of what your sort of thoughts on the crypto sphere is, but I don't think we ever actually introduced what it is you do. What do you do, Simon? Okay, so I'm CEO of uh, the XX Foundation, which is basically we're building out a protocol. We um, are kind of moving a whole bunch of stuff on chain. So that means we're taking stuff out of the old world and putting it into the new world for the simplest explanation possible. Um, so a whole bunch of kind of decentralization around borrowing, lending, spending, uh, et cetera. We're working with some of the leading uh, platforms in the industry, such as Ledger, Tezos, OneInch, uh, Opera Crypto, Opera Browser, the wallet they're building. Nice. Actually built on Astac. I, saw, I, saw um, I saw that. Yeah. And then kind of prior to this, I worked uh, on a few projects that were backed by Mr. Bankman Freed, which was uh, probably a whole podcast slash therapy session in itself. Um, <laughs> I think kind of, you know, original background was kind of VC finance. Um, so I was a VC fund manager for a bit for US endowment. And then um, prior to that, I was kind of in banking, mainly kind of telecom media technology focused. So, so, and the ledger thing was pretty recently, if I recall as well, wasn't it? Or, or is this, have you, have you been from uh, yeah, Ledger was uh, the go live for the UK was June last year. Uh, Europe was Q4, so I think kind of yeah. October. Uh, yep. We will be bringing that into the US a little bit later in the year. Um, we're just kind of finalizing the launch plans as we speak. 
So basically, what's quite cool about that is going back to the point I made earlier about you know, not your not your coins, not your keys, not your coins. We're actually putting yeah. a non a Mastercard into the ledger suite, so it's a non custodial mobile wallet. So if you think about it in the purest sense, uh, it basically means that you know you link this to your card and you can go out and spend this on your card anywhere that Mastercard's accepted or Visa. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Are you, are, are, and, and that's, I mean, that's a big, it's not a, it's not a minor a, accomplishment. Um, I mean, all of this sounds kind of, well, all of it is obviously non-trivial, but the thing that kind of gets me, so I, I work in tech uh, and I've discovered there are two types of people who uh, get crypto uh, and then who don't get crypto, right? Um, old people and then young people. And I haven't really found, uh, t I mean, obviously there's exceptions, right? My, I don't know how old Michael Saylor is, but you know, when you look at sort of the traditional finance world, um, there seems to be a lot of, uh, what's the word? Resentment towards crypto folks. Um, and I wonder sometimes, like, how are you? How are you able to promote the use of these technologies and, and block block just blockchain based technologies in general in these in these different industries and in, in these you know in some cases traditional industries that have been around for decades, almost a hundred, sometimes a hundred plus years old. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. I mean, I think first and foremost, terminology, right? Weirdly, you yeah. know, if you go into to a bank about crypto, they'll often run away. If you talk about blockchain, that's fine because they already have blockchain <laughs> in their systems, right? Um, but yeah, you know, I, I liken this period a little bit to when I was a kid, right? Which was a long time ago now. Um, and I remember, you know, not that the, long, Simon. Stop that. I know. Stop. <laughs> Let's I remember settle down with the, that. Back yeah. in the year two thousand, reading yeah. articles in certain newspapers that were predicting the death of the internet, right? Because, quote, not many people were using it, right? <laughs> yeah, and I feel I that. It, like, uh, you know, if you remember the days of kind of, you know, dial-up modems and, you know, kind yeah. of sounded like, you know, sounded like someone was dying on the telephone uh, if you picked the phone up whilst you were kind of, you know, dialing in. Um, and I think, you know, we're... We're at that kind of stage right now where the utility is there, the technology is there. It's not necessarily as usable for the average person as it should be. However, you know, you can see that the next generation of projects will bring in stuff that kind of has a real improvement on what we already have on the World Wide Web, you know, Web, web 2 as it's commonly referred to. And I, I think we're kind of at that embryonic stage where people are trying different things, which is you know, generally quite exciting. And seeing where the real benefits are, because you know, if you look back the history of the internet, you know, mm. in the early days it was all about you know kind of being above governments. It was kind of you know crypto punks. It was Napster was yes. available, um, Pirate Bay, Put Locker, etc. Everything was free. Everything was available, and then that kind of got rain back but a lot of that philosophy actually you know went over into the early days of kind of cryptography actually it was all about how you created yes. these systems that were above governments that were global and i think you know what you're going to see probably in web3 is kind of a an expansion of of liberty and freedom which is a good thing to talk about to an american uh where there's less um central control um yes Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're I think we're early, but I think it's exciting. I I, I yeah I, I I'd agree with you. I mean, uh, it is a good. By the way, that is it's funny that I'm guessing you've been in a lot of meetings, and uh, for you to come to that conclusion, I'm guessing with Americans, uh, they love themselves uh, some liberty, um, and in the right yeah. circumstances. Yeah. 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 So it right. doesn't involve like a woman's right. body with their rights or something like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Look, rules are rules, Simon. Uh, so, you know. 
<laughs> what were you say, Tarek? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Just that the whole liberty, freedom thing. I get really uncomfortable if somebody tells me about the freedom that I will get from something. <laughs> because I know that that freedom means that people can steal from me. Or, you know, they can take my shit because I'm free. I'm uh, unprotected in any way. Exactly. Uh, my liberty is to be taken advantage of. Exactly. It's the classic kind of, uh, you know, you have freedom of speech, but that doesn't mean you uh, don't have responsibility, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think just to go back to your question for a second, you know, it's really about um, breaking it down into the product layer and not talking about the technology saying, hey, this is the functionality, this is what it achieves. Because I think that's basically how you win, right? I mean, you didn't use Facebook because they talked right. to you about all the lines of code that powered it. You used Facebook because you could kind of get laid on there in the early days um, <laughs> or find your old school girlfriend or whatever, right? Um, and that kind of worked. It brought people together that wanted to be brought together. It, kept people apart who want to be kept apart and i think you know it's, it's as basic as that it's like how do you actually build products that have better capability or better benefits to the user um than using the traditional models right it's how you kind of distribute stuff to people i think is the key well, well this this leads me to a, a, an interesting question about sort of your own company, you know, how is it different from other platform? Oh, or Derek, were you going to jump in? Sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. No, I'm, what make, I'm writing down. What makes this, you know, uh, Bax different from other platforms? In in the spirit of, of, I mean, what you just said. Well, look, firstly, we're not, we're not going to steal anyone's money. Um, that's, that's always a good place to start. Um, you heard it here first, great. folks. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not even five dollars. Um, yeah. I think um, <laughs> what, makes, I think what makes us different is kind of the interesting thing about us is that we're almost like a network, right? Because you know we are a B two B platform, so we work with other platforms and we provide services that they plug into. So we got kind of you know, well, you're B two B. Yeah, yeah, we're B two B to C. That is B two B to unique. C. Yeah, yeah. So we're no, B2B but that's still unique. Yeah. Yeah. So we're plugged into kind of 30 different underlying platforms. So actually, you know, you can kind of capture the benefit of being, you know, for example, a Ledger CL user, but you can capture that benefit on other platforms as well. Um, I think also um, probably for us, it's the piece of how we've kind of come together because the team's kind of quite varied. So we've got a few TradFi people, but you know, you need those guys because you okay. need to be able to make things work. Um, what are TradFi people? People who work for banks. Traditional finance. <laughs> exactly. Did I get that one right? Nailed it. You did. Yeah. I'll send yes. you. I'll, I'll send yeah, you to yeah, the yeah. XF passing your crypto proficiency exam. <laughs> 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 um, and um, so that's um, that's the first piece. We've got some entrepreneurs. You've got some you know, general kind of blockchain people, and we've always kind of come at this from a philosophy of saying that you know how do you take friction out of a journey and how do you make the user experience better, mm. i.e. more rewarding? I think that's probably the thing that kind of is out for us. And then because of how we build our customer base, yeah, you know, we don't have to go and spend you know, $100 million sponsoring an arena or putting ads on the Super Bowl to get customers, which means a lot of that kind of development. Not naming any back. names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Which means a lot of that can go back into... You know, actual products, natural benefit. Um, so that, that's mm. that's kind of part of the philosophy. And I think also to some extent we've kind of been quite lucky because there are a lot of people in our industry who do what we do. You know, we do borrowing, lending, you can earn, you yeah. can do all these different things, who everyone thought was super, super smart and they weren't. And now they're not around anymore. And that kind of gives us the window of opportunity yeah. to really kind of show people how it should be done. Yeah. Yeah, no. I, I, I. It's funny that you say that because that's kind of how I saw. Because I was gonna do some MEV stuff. Uh, for those of you who don't know what MEV is, uh, it, I'm a scoundrel, uh, and go look it up. So, uh, yeah, I was gonna look into to doing some MEV, MEV stuff after the the huge FTX crash. So I was like, why not? You know, because a lot of those people are gone. 
I mean, uh, yeah. most, I mean, like I, I, I keep track of the trends, right? Like I know the way I keep track of, of how hot the market is, is not, you know, s simply through liquidity, but op I mean, obviously, right. It's through like a, a confluence of, of different things, of different factors. Uh, but the one, one of the things I, I definitely pay clo close attention to is who's talking about it. And, and I think we're, like you said, we're in that, we're, we're in the, uh, uh, it's time to build. It's time to, it's time to, uh, accumulate, you know what I mean? But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I think you're right. Um, I think it's a little bit like, you know, you always kind of view these periods now like the year 2000, right? We had the you know, the dot com yep. bubble. Yep. Uh, at one point, you know, everyone was sold on the idea the internet was the future and the dot com bubble. And if you had dot com in your name, you were worth $100 million, right? And frankly, you know, beyond the fact that a lot of these people got drunk and went to parties for two years and all the work got done. Um, and I, I still get you know, big parallels between where we are now and, and that because you know, it's a sector because you look at it and think, well, in reality, what always happens in bubbles like that is that the the next generation of companies that win, you know, I think back to the, you know, if you look at the dot-com bubble, you'd say, well, you know, companies like Amazon came not too long after that. You know, companies like Facebook yep. came not Correct. too long after that. Correct. And, yeah. and actually, they couldn't have happened if it wasn't for the fact people had built the infrastructure because the dot-com bubble. No, that's... That, so, uh, go on. We need to blame a lot of the problems on those people. What they that's the butterfly wing that is the hurricane of Amazon and Facebook right now. Hmm. Absolutely. But yeah, if there hadn't been a dot com bubble, there would have been, <laughs> there would have been no PayPal. If there'd been no PayPal, how would people at Amazon have started oh. expecting orders, right? <laughs> and then not PayPal, then there's no Elon Musk. Yeah. And there's no Twitter getting sunk hey, this is great <laughs> i like tracing it back this way yeah this, the, you, you're talking about it like a like a basketball trade mm. like if lebron james doesn't move teams then this guy doesn't move here and all this it, it all circles back around it's great exactly. and then I, we wouldn't be able to put billionaires having rocket races with each other now you see exactly i i, I some guy shot a dick into space yeah exactly. well <laughs> I think lots Jeff of Bezos, I think lots of blue, Jeff Bezos yeah. big big blue dick would not have gone to space. Do you think his do you think Jeff Bezos' dick is blue? What do you think? I mean, it flies like a blue dick, it looks like a blue dick. Right. No, that's a fair counterpoint. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, uh if it sound if it sounds like a blue dick, it talks like a blue dick. It's probably a blue dick is what I've learned. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I think, I think you're right. I think we're entering this new uh, era and that's, pre I think it's funny that you say all this because I was thinking about this the other day. We're kind of in the prefaces, at least in terms of the, 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 the annals of history and in terms of, uh, of, of a preface to something that might be much larger coming down mm -hmm. right this might be our pre-amazon moment whatever amazon is in in crypto um mm -hmm. although it might take some time i think to get there especially you know i mean I, there's been all this talk about a recession this year uh i think a lot of people are worried about it me personally um you know not financial advice uh you know i bought a BTC here and there, but I'm still kind of waiting, man. Um, mm. What What are your thoughts on all this chatter? Uh, you know, do you think a recession is is actually coming? And you know, if one is coming, how bad do you think it'll be? Derek, do you want to tell? Oh yeah, um, I, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think so. I think it's going to be um, a lot of hype for nothing. Okay, uh, sell, sell, yeah. guys, sell every. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jim Craver has entered the chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. 
just whatever Derek. Derek's good at many things, but uh, when it comes to this, just do the opposite, you know? So Right. Yeah. 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 I already yeah. told you I lost 25 bucks. I knew it was still Mr. Media. <laughs> and it was gone. I can't yeah. be trusted. Derek. I've lost 25. I can't. Yeah. And you see, if you deposit that $25 oh, in FTX, you probably would have got some of it back yeah. eventually. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, eventually. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the dollar back. <laughs> Um, no, I, I think, do you know what, like, it's, it's actually a really, it's a really difficult call, right? I think, um, that right. was not financial, so I should add, because you look at what's going on in the world right now and you look at, you know, Ukraine, you look at the tensions in, you know, Asia over, you know, China and Taiwan and those kind of places, you think, well, you know, like any single one of those different conflicts or potential conflicts, I should say, could trigger a kind of, you know, massive fallout right in the economy right um but you know i think it's going to happen right now is exactly this i I actually don't think we were going to have a bad recession i think we will have a recession i think kind of covid was an inevitability um that there would then be a recession afterwards because there were a load of issues created by it and you've got all these supply chain problems inflation problems etc but i think unfortunately the, the sad thing about this is it's going to go back really to being the same situation that we had back in the credit crisis, right? Where the people who are actually going to end up paying for this are actually the people who probably can't afford to pay for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's That's it's not... Cool. Exactly. So it's not... You know, people who have good jobs, people who have, you know, good pay, etc., are going to sit there and say, well, my bills have gone up a little bit this month. And it's like, wow, you know, what difference that actually makes your life? Whereas people who are actually mm-hmm. struggling to survive are going to be the ones who are actually really going to you know, really pay for this. Um, and I think uh, it's kind of suitably depressing. Um, but, you know, to me, it feels like, uh, you know, with a bit of inflation and interest rates going up, it's going to wash through, but there will be a, a few financial casualties along the way. But I, I don't think we're heading for a recession. And I think, uh, you know, if you look at the stock markets, they kind of pumped and then they... Yep crashed and now they're stabilizing again and crypto's mirrored that other asset classes have mirrored that and you know i just think and it's a risk any- asset yeah yeah too. so watching that flow so, to risk assets has been interesting yeah go on sorry simon i know i just say so i think realistically any asset that produces yield you know that, that is meaningful that has an income derivable from it so that will become more valuable than the one that doesn't because we've got inflation so yeah. I think as long as people kind of you know stick to the fairly basic fundamentals for a little while, look at where T bills are trading, look at where interest rates are, look where inflation is, and say, well, yeah, what 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 would I go and buy? And there's all kinds of different protocol scanners you can look at for fee attribution in crypto, uh, where you can say, well, actually, you know, if I had this, I'd earn that in my wallet from it. Um, I think that's actually probably an area where crypto does have advantages because, to some extent, like things like staking rewards. Uh, which is where mm. you agree basically to not sell your crypto by putting it into a smart contract, a right, staking right. smart contract for a period. You know, they were some of those were paying out at some points on things like USDC and USDT, kind of seven or eight percent at the point that your bank account was paying you nothing. Um, so of course, no wonder they became so popular, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you're gone. Now, just, just to answer your question, I suppose more succinctly, I think it's going to be a slightly painful year, but I don't think it's kind of a, a wholesale structural recession. I think it's more of some sectors, some places, some people will take a bit of pain. But overall, um, I think, you know, it, it, we're probably going to skirt a deep recession and just go into a kind of reset recession, which happens in theory, according to various economists, every seven years. <laughs> so you're saying that... To- Go on, go on, go on. That sounds, that that was the, like, that was exactly what an economist sounds like. Like, that is, that's the economist answer, right? I mean, yeah. And, and the I key don't know to what it meant by that. You have to just keep, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just have to keep saying it all the time. Within every seven yep. years, there'll be a recession cycle. And then you can just wind back to any given date and say, hey, seven years ago, I predicted this. I was right. Yeah, I was right. Yeah. 
Yeah. I've actually been saying, no, I mean, well, seven years ago, I was saying. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So I'm wondering now, like, is Powell somewhere just having, like, mind, like, blowing sex because he thinks he's going to be right this year? Just, you know, like, honey, you know, this is, I think it's going to, I think we're that soft landing is coming, uh, but not for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to no. be anything but a soft landing, sweetheart. Uh, I think he's looking at Jeff Bezos's big blue penis and thinking mm. he needs to up the interest rates because of inflation. Is <laughs> <laughs> pa- Powell has been remarkably clear. He's been inter- it's, it's interesting watching like the sort of the talk. If you don't know who, who we're talking about, uh, Jerome Powell uh, is the head of the Fed, uh, chair of the Federal Reserve. Blah blah blah, uh, and. Uh, I don't know. To me, he's been pretty remarkably, he's pretty straightforward. He kind of says what he's going to do and then he does it. And people seem to play politics with what he says. Uh, and the reason why they pay so close attention to what he says, uh, if you don't know why, is because uh, that determines interest rates. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the reason why you're seeing prices uh, at the levels that they are, are because of, you know, the moves that, that, People like like well, that like his organization uh, and Powell specifically is is making so um, yeah so 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 blame Powell they'll blame Jerome Powell uh, if you're angry yeah, that's why eggs are like eleven dollars an egg correct yes yeah yeah, yeah. I'm loving the buy it right it's now. not avian flu what's that I'm loving the fact that right now COVID. not avian flu oh sorry yeah. <laughs> we ruined each other's jokes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or improve Robert. them depending on how you look at it. That's, that's right, uh, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm knowing the fact that right now there's probably some kind of Colin Powell tribute account getting a load of abuse on Twitter because of your comments, Buzz. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I can't wait. Come at me, bro. I'm going to be fine. Yeah. And we find you have a Jerome Powell. You have a Twitter dedicated to Jer- Jerome Powell. You clearly don't go get any pussy. So this is going to be a cakewalk for me. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Colin Powell. Gotta be watching out for people. Colin Powell. Hmm. I, yeah, yeah I, think, I think he meant. I think he meant Jerome Powell. I, I skirted yeah. past it, Derek. I assumed. He meant oh, Jerome. No, I assumed I, he meant Jerome Powell. I, no, I was actually just trying to make a bad joke about you know whenever someone missed tags on the, on Twitter. There's probably a whole bunch of people who are confusing their powers right, right now because there's only really two hilarious. famous powers in the US public life. Right? I mean, one of my friends, her sister, her sister is called Sinead O'Connor. And every time the singer Sinead O'Connor does something bad, her social media channels are just the best. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, I think that there's going to be uh, the interest is going to be um, if you look at kind of T bills, right? In, you know, which is yeah. U.S. Treasury. And what are T-bills? Right. Okay. U.S. Treasury bills. So U.S. government debt, right? And you look at the kind of yield mm-hmm. spike on those. Um, that really shot up last year, but now it's dipping a little bit, which suggests that maybe people think inflation is going to become you know, a little bit less of an issue. And also, I think what you're going to see probably in America, again, like, you know, this year is that household things like traditional household debt, so like auto debt, etc. The default rates will go up quite high um, mm. because you know there's a whole bunch of people driving around in their car that they can't actually afford to own, but they could afford it because the interest rate was reasonably. What low. Americans? Yeah. What I buying know. things they couldn't afford? Oh, it's just the same. same in Europe, buddy. Um, yeah, you can get your Porsche for. <laughs> Your hundred thousand dollar Porsche for two thousand <laughs> months, right? Um, Fine. And you, that, yeah, see, the dream is real. Um, yeah. But you you look at that and you think to yourself, well, hang on, you know, what's going to happen is you're going to start to see a disconnect in the consumer debt market, i.e., default. And actually, if you look at kind of monetary policy in recent years, which is what people like Jerome Powell said, yeah, you know, they then start to get into this kind of cakewalk, right? Where they've got to ensure financial stability. That's the other part of their mandate right so they've got to keep the dollar strong they're going to have financial stability etc then what they realize is oh you know what things are going to get worse here because the banks are going to start having to default or you know get a bailout or whatever 
because interest rates have gone up and therefore defaults got up. So I think you've probably seen that kind of uh, interest rate mechanism starting to slide out. And you might even see quantitative easing where Jay Powell decides to print money, come back, if household debt gets that bad. Look out, Bitcoin boys. The music's about to start again. Yeah, no, yeah. You know, um, because in theory, any whole asset at that point, you know, becomes worth a lot more. Um, so yeah, I, I think to me, you know, overall, I'm 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 more optimistic now, weirdly, than I was last year, because mm. 2021, a lot of weird stuff happened that didn't make any sense to me, like companies like Peloton being valued at you know billions and billions of dollars for an exercise bike that talks to you. Um, and Jeff Bezos is giant blue and a people. treadmill that eats kids. Exactly. What, 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 um, what treadmill oh, eats kids? Peloton, they, they have that. They have a treadmill that I just sent back that uh, it will kill children because it will pull them underneath it. Peloton does. Yeah. 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 But like any any price. <laughs> yeah, strangely <laughs> killing kids. <laughs> your self price. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but it's a bit like you know you, you look at kind of like you know like the Chamax spats or spacks or that stuff which um mm-hmm. kind of all get huge and then went worthless right and you know there's a whole period in kind of two thousand two thousand one where you thought hey what the hell is actually going on here I think actually last year was really the correction where people went you know what this is just a treadmill that eats kids and therefore we probably don't want any stock in it <laughs> um and that's okay. why. Stock price went down ninety odd percent. So, and I think yeah, the fact the markets have absorbed that and still continue to function, and there's still money out there, it's just that actually we're in a better place than some people think. Yeah. No. I. I well, I mean, so go on. No recession is what you're saying. I think it was. We, was I right? If we, it'll be a light. If we have one, it'll be a light recession. So it's a classic answer, non answer. Um, I'm in <laughs> economics lectures at any university in America. <laughs> a true LSE uh, graduate. Uh, wh- okay, all right. Well, then let's let's take it down. Uh, what do you guys say in your Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings universe? What would what should the man on the omnibus do? If he's got a couple of coins, a couple of shekels, you know, in the his man, pocket. The man what do you guys the say? The man on. The man of the what? Clapham Omnibus. Clapham only. Is that why is it called Omnibus. the Clapham only? Omnibus. Oh, Clapham Omnibus. Yes, correct. Yes. All right. Yeah. All right. So, um, so if let's presume he's having a good day, right? He might get some extra cheese on his pizza, right? Because he's been saving enough money uh, for for a while now. What does he do with his money this year? Or does he does he stay on the sidelines? You know, I, I think um, I mean not not financial. Or does advice. he put all 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 that money into that? What was that? What was that uh, mining company Black BlackRock just bought that Bitcoin? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, um, the yeah, I can't remember their name now, but yeah, the crypto miner. Um, yeah, yeah. Where do you put your money? I mean, that that's the. The existential question in life, which frankly, if I was right, I wouldn't need to work. Um, but um, <laughs> kind of not financial advice, but I would say that um, right now, I think, you know, you look at the market, you'd say you got to go towards quality assets that you think are cheap, right? And I think that's the same for stock markets. I think that's the same for, you know, uh, crypto. It's the same for any asset class. You know, if you believed in Bitcoin when it was, 60,000, then in theory, you should be a buyer at 20,000 because you should still believe in it, right? Um, Correct. In the same way that, you know, if you see your stock of your bank has gone down 50% <laughs> in value and you still think it's a good bank, why well, wouldn't you buy stock in it, right? So to me, there's a market where you should do um, what colloquially is called DCA, dollar cost average, which means that basically, you know, you, you say, well, look, if I look at I, I believe in these assets. I'm going to invest in these assets for a period of time because I believe that they will grow. And therefore, you know, I, I start buying now because it's cheaper. And if I keep buying, actually, what I'm doing really now is netting down my average in price. 
on the asset. Yeah. 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 There's, there's, That's right. there's truth to that. I, I mean, I should have invested in Monster. I found that out the other day. Uh, apparently, uh, if you look at the S&P for 10 years, uh, Monster Energy Drink had a 100,000% return. Uh, the problem is um, I was a child uh, and did not own money. Uh, but man, if I did, would have thrown all that money into Monster. Oh. I mean, I'm, I, by the way, this isn't a joke. Go look at the chart. It's hysterical. In a, I, yeah. I, I totally believe that. Have you, have you ever met anybody who drinks Monsters? Yes. You know it because they drink it all day. Like they're constantly <laughs> chugging Monster. I think my sister buys, I don't know, she buys them 24 cases every couple of days. Just She drinks it nonstop. It's just jet fuel. It's just jet fuel yeah. in a consumable format. I had a chemist, one of my friends a chemist, and she explained the breakdown. Like she, she broke it down on a chemical level, what happens to you as you drink one of these drinks. So... Uh, uh yeah no go for it go for it uh i'm sure there's there'll be no repercussions okay so uh you you you, you sidestepped the question uh and and gave a very uh who's the dude the money matters or what to do with your money guy frick's his name uh frick the guy who hates bitcoin uh cool. there's a lot of them the what's that Jim Cramer? Jim Cramer? <laughs> no, the other guy uh, who's like simple. You only do simple things with money, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what's his name? Warren Buffett. Nailed it. <laughs> I have, uh, do I have his book? I have his book. No, I do not. Anyway, there's Dave oh, Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. That's what it is. So you gave the Dave Ra Ramsey answer, right? Put your money in places that you believe in. Uh, or Warren Buffett, I think he says that too, right? Like put it in companies. I don't really pay attention to what Warren Buffett says. I don't think, you know, I, I'm not really sure what he's what, what he's done or what he's about. So uh, I figure it's best to ignore what he does. Um, you know, how 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 does someone navigate that sort of landscape? Like, the, it, it sounds like there's a bunch of things co complicating this this you know, overall uh, landscape that it's really hard, I think, for, for the layman to sort of distinguish. Like something you mentioned earlier, which I thought was interesting, was uh, how war affects all this. And I don't think the average person makes that connection between war and crypto. Why would war uh, and why would in political instability even, you know, uh, come to mind when, when, you, when you discuss these things? Well, I think you have to look at the kind of natural flow of assets, right? So if you assume that, mm -hmm. you know, most assets that come into crypto space come from fiat, right? Um, if you assume that, you know, you want to be able to convert assets out of crypto back into fiat at some point in the future, et cetera. And the simple reality of it is that, you know, you say you go to war and gas prices go up a thousand percent, right? People don't feel rich and therefore they're probably unlikely to speculate, right? I mean, I suppose 99% of speculation is built on the fact that people feel that they're rich, right? It's like the same thing when you go down to Miami, as I did last year, and you sit in the most overpriced restaurants and bars in America. I have no idea complete... what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw you there. Uh, <laughs> with, with the crystal. Um, but, you know, the, the most overpriced bars and restaurants in America, um, you know, eating and drinking, $60, you know, $60 pastas and $200 bottles of wine, right? But there's right. lots of people doing it. And you think, well, who are these people? You know, like, I, I know there's money in America, um, but, you know, there isn't wall-to-wall -wall money everywhere, right? But and what you realize right. when you actually look at people is most of these people are people who have a decent income, but they feel relaxed about spending because, hey, even if they spend a little bit too much this month, they got next month's paycheck, or they can spread it on their credit card, or they can do whatever, right? And, and of course, once you go through that cycle of breaking that kind of consumer confidence, right? You know, mm. um, and that can happen with any event of disruption, um, whether it be a war or, you know, black swan event, right? 
People don't feel mm. wealthy. I mean, if people don't feel wealthy, they don't want to speculate. You know, it's a bit like if I gave you ten thousand mm. dollars today, right, and said to you, "There's ten thousand dollars," and you had no money before, and then I say, "Actually, you're getting another ten thousand dollars on the same day next month," right? Yeah, if you were to take those two different scenarios and say, "What would you do if you had ten thousand dollars? You had no idea where the next ten thousand dollars was coming from," versus what you would do if you had ten thousand mm. dollars and you knew you got ten thousand next month and look at your pattern of behavior and your spending you know they would be completely different right um mm. and i think you know that's 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 the key thing when people start to lose confidence or the disruption or even in some instances you know you get some very practical issues like uh you may even have crypto traders or funds sat in those war zones i mean we certainly saw that in ukraine for example in the early days yeah. of the um, barbaric russian invasion of a, of a peaceful, innocent country, um, there was some fairly big disruption in the industry because actually a lot of people that we, you know, we even had a team in Kiev ourselves, right? So you there did? was a period. Of, yeah, we had a service delivery unit in Kiev. Um, Jesus Christ. I had a, 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 just a real quick, not to interrupt you, but I had a, I had a team of engineers in, in Kiev as well. So, anyways, go on. Yeah. No, absolutely. And yeah, so those kind of factors become pretty real pretty fast, right? They yeah, they come at you pretty fast. And I would just say, by the way, on that point, our team in Ukraine were some of the most incredible people I've ever seen in my life. Yes. Right? I mean we actually 100%. we actually had yeah. yeah. We actually had people who had signed up to fight, right? Who were being sent away to do whatever they were doing. And then when they were coming off duty, they were doing their work. <laughs> I mean, I'm not being funny, but if I was, you know, in that situation myself, the last thing I'd be thinking about was working on my job. You know, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I got a story for you. I got a, but we're gonna call him Greg because I don't want to give his real name. I remember we were uh, pair programming on a problem uh, for a client, one of our clients, and uh, I remember I don't know if it was a mortar or something explode in the background, and I was like. Hey Greg, you want to go check that out? Like, you want to stop real quick and see what that was? And he's like, "Ah, don't worry about it." And then we just kept—he just kept going, and just kept <laughs> working. <laughs> I don't know, man. They're made of different stuff over there, I guess. So, yeah, yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, I was, uh, yeah, some of the stories we got. And I think, I think, probably my favorite story was that a bunch of our guys. Who didn't actually work for us? They worked for a dev house, but we was a mm. you know, supplier. Well, it was based over there. We're telling us stories about you know, what do you get up to at the weekend? But oh yeah, we hacked a Russian oil refinery because they were working <laughs> with the numbers. <laughs> so they were kind of like you know spending their weekends kind of you know trying to destroy Russian infrastructure whilst uh, <laughs> and they coming in on Monday morning and kind of proudly tell you that they've managed to hack a train signaling network the week at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> they're goddamn good engineers they're no seriously like if you like if anyone's watching this uh everyone always does for what's it called for actually i shouldn't reveal this but whatever uh people always get their their off off uh, shore workers in engineering in india you're making a mistake you're making yeah. a huge mistake uh Absolutely. go to go to eastern europe bro or or some yeah. parts of latin america you're going to get your, they just, there's just a hunger and there's a proficiency there that is just you, not, not to speak ill of, you know, offshore Indian, you know, firms. It's just, it's been a different experience for me personally. So something yeah. to consider. But it's really a friend yeah, of mine's so. a company is called star.global, right? And uh, their main mm -hmm. operating base, uh, it was in Kiev. I think it's been a, it's still there, but I think it's been a little bit more decentralized, but now and he was saying to me yeah the interesting thing was that when they first set it up they're based in silicon valley but then their operating base was ukraine um was that if you look back at the history of the ussr all of the space program and the rocket programs and everything were all actually based in ukraine which meant that you had the best technical universities and some of the brightest technical minds based in ukraine so when they went in you know they were hiring people who could kind of literal rocket scientists right <laughs> yeah. 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 um and of course you know that that then became 
a thing because you know if you were an IT professional in Ukraine, you were earning five times more than your neighbour, which then of course meant that the next generation came along and thought, ah, that's a way of making money. Yeah, that's a good industry. It's a good job. So of course, weirdly, it's mm. kind of perpetuated on that cycle going all the way back to the USSR, where um, you know it's just seen as a good industry. And it's it's actually really interesting about places like Ukraine and been there a little bit. And it's actually you know, how diverse it is. There's a lot of women who work in coding and engineering in, in Ukraine. It's not just men. Whereas if you look at you know Europe and America, there are too few women in in, in tech. In America, the the white women are doing fine. I'll I'll tell you that. In Ukraine, yeah, there are are a lot of. Uh... There are a lot of. I, it's funny because you said there are a lot of women in Ukraine, and I was like, I got tense for a little bit. A little bit. I was like, I wonder where he's going with this one. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad that we landed on. There's a lot of female engineers. It's like, oh, whew, okay, all right, because I don't know what that <laughs> is gonna. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I know Simon. This isn't gonna go. Okay, good. Uh, uh, yeah, no, there are, there's. I have a girl. Go ahead. I get shot. Anything else about that? <laughs> I, I don't have a girlfriend, but to quote the great Mitch Hedberg, uh, I do know a woman who'd be very upset if I said that. So uh, I get it. I totally get it. I, I, I'm curious how, like, okay, so you're the CEO of this project. I don't know if you're like me. Uh, I fail all the time. I don't have a posh accent, first generation immigrant. I keep nailing on your posh accent. I know, but it's all out of love. Uh, and I will do so forever as for as long as I know you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and <laughs> it's my pleasure. Uh, so first generation immigrant, right? Um, I fail constantly. Um, I failed today. This morning, uh, I woke up on my face. Uh, so that's a, you know, right, right, right away, right? You know, that that's, that's uh, what the day is going to be like. Um, you know, I, I, I tried a bunch of different business endeavors and uh, some of them have, done okay a lot of them have not a lot of them have failed right and it's only recently i feel like i've started hitting my stride in certain things i'm curious especially in in, in industry like crypt like crypto where things are so volatile i mean i'm not gonna lie man I, you know my first cycle i i invested in dogecoin just i made a respectable amount on doge but it wasn't because i made some sort of calculated you know what i mean it wasn't there was no yeah. risk reward uh, analysis it was just Hey, this seems like uh, uh, a funny thing. And then four years later, I, I see on Satoshi street bets that people going crazy and I wake up and look at my portfolio and it's like, okay, interesting. Uh, but like stuff like that is just, you know, it's just a coincidence and it's kind of reflective of the, the, the intrinsic sort of chaos of, of, of that industry. Like basically what I'm getting at is with that intrinsic chaos, where were you able to finally uh, find your footing? Or do, were you just one of those people who just was like, nah, I get it, and then just kind of pushed forward? Uh, yeah, it's a good question, right? And um, actually, it's interesting. One thing you said there was the key thing to that, what you said to me is you, you recognize your, your failure, right? In the sense that the fact you brought that up means you're cognizant of it, which actually a lot of people don't realize they failed in life, which actually, you know, sometimes when we make mistakes and we fail, regret is the greatest teacher, right? Um, but I think, you know, look, there is no formula for it, right? I mean, if you could write a formula to say, hey, this is how you achieve everything in life, um, everyone would do it and then it wouldn't work. Um, I think, you know, kind of for us, it's been a case of... Um, really starting off with a very clear problem that we solved, mm. being lucky enough to partner with some really great names in our sector. Um, and also, you know, kind of being in the right place at the right time, you know, mm. uh, to be able yeah, to land those clients. Part of it. Yeah, mm. exactly. I mean, like, you know, for example, one of our biggest clients today referred someone to us who has the potential to be one of our biggest clients because we are the only people who've done certain things that we've done in our sector, like putting cards in non-custodial wallets, for example, for third parties. Interesting. Like um, Wait, say that again. Say that again. That's important. That's salient. What'd you say? One, one of the first people to put on-chain spending with a non-custodial card in, in yes, yeah, sorry, with a card in a non-custodial wallet. And why is that so, salient? 
Well, why it's sailing is you're actually building a new payments network in the process, because whilst you're using the MasterCard for the acceptance and the validation of the payment, the messaging and the transmission layer is all on chain. So in that case, it's on Solana. Um, so in theory, you're kind of behind the back end, you're redesigning a whole chunk of card scheme payments, which people don't really think about it, but just remember the fact that every time you pay anywhere in the world, Visa and MasterCard take a percentage of that. That's a yep. lot of money. I worked, I, I wrote the coding to some of those systems. I am very aware of that infrastructure. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And it, it's actually quite bad and defective as well. I mean, you look at the 8583 messaging standards and everything else. It's just a joke. It's a little old. It's a little old. Yeah. One might say. Old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of kind of how you navigate it in an industry, I mean, I think it's just the same as any other early stage industry, right? You've got to, you got to back your bets and know when they're dead, right? And know which ones you, know, you should stay with. And I think, you know, probably trading crypto is similar to that, right? I mean, personally, I've never been an in and out trader in the, in the market, right? And what do you yeah, mean? there are, well, what I mean by that is I've never been one of these people who buys something, watches it pump, sells it, you know, <laughs> get back into <laughs> <laughs> cases cases the bong coin or you know whatever it might be I, i've never done that and some people do that really really well but you know you have to sit mm. there and you have to look at effectively the hype metric you know i.e how hard is this thing being pushed by people and right. therefore will more, will more people buy it right because generally the more wants right. to hold some higher the value right um i've never been into that because i don't really have the time to do that <laughs> But I've always kind of looked at my projects from perspective and say, well, you know, what does this actually achieve? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. if I was going to trade something for a general barometer of confidence in crypto, it'd be, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? You know, because yes. that's the, generally speaking, you know, that is the market in terms of scale. Um, but, you know, I think like all these things, when it's so early, frankly, I mean, there's probably people at home who make more money trading crypto in the next three years than I will. And I work in the industry because they're just, right. you know, backing their bets and taking their shots and one or two of them will land. But, so but, but, but Simon, uh, yeah, I mean, and more power to them, to be honest with you, I can't, I mean, I, I've, I've had some great trades again, Dogecoin being one of them. Um, but that was, again, for me, I mean, it was just luck. I feel like, man, you know, I don't really, I don't know. I, I don't really look like, like I liked trading and I think it's an interesting science. Um, mm -hmm. I like it when it's reduced to uh, uh, algorithmically or when it's reduced, uh, when, when, when I can use maths to determine the likelihood of a trade, I'm, I feel much more confident because I don't, but, but to your point, I think there is something to be said. I think you're, what you're describing to me is essentially is the the the, uh, the approach of a fundamentals trader, which is mm. also very pretty. I mean, I think that's a solid approach. Uh, asking questions like, "Hey, uh, will people buy this?" <laughs> is pro is probably a really good question, right? And Will this, you know, will this actually actually work? Who's getting birds, you know, this money coming from? But, but my, what I'm more curious is, is to, and maybe you're, you're, you're dodging this question on purpose, but I'm curious what you had to go through and what your story is like and how hard that's been, or if it hasn't been hard or how long that's been. Um, in life or in the last few years? Just Oh, in just the, the crypto industry. I mean, in life, you could go into life if you want to get go into it, yeah. No, I, I, I would say I've been reasonably lucky, right? Because, I mean, I, I've been in crypto since about 2013, right? That was when I start, started buying some oh, wow. crypto, right? Um, some nice. of which are yeah. probably worthless and I don't even know if they exist anymore. Others of which are, you know, slightly more interesting. Um, and overall, I've been pretty lucky i have lost some money on different things um were you in, were you in gox i had a little bit in gox yeah um you poor thing okay so that's yeah. it okay gotcha um so i had some stuff in gox but uh, it was actually all stuff we mined uh, going back to your mev point earlier wow. um 
but um yeah um but then you know in terms of like professionally i was actually kind of you know really kind of bought into the industry by being asked if i wanted to be in the industry you know by people so my mm. before i was managing fund i was a it kind of running an early stage kind of fintech funds so investing in kind of you know all things kind of payments and peripheral, so you know, cybersecurity, the work identity. I do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the all God's work. God's work as I call it, right? Um <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying on the inside. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> That's and, so funny. Um, and a lot of a lot of kind of what I saw is there were a lot of people kind of coming into that space who would kind of reach out to someone like me because you know, reasonably lucky in the sense that, you know when you manage a portfolio of assets, you understand enough about everything that you kind of know how to get stuff done um, without really knowing how to do anything particularly well. Um, and kind of, you know, struggling with these very particular challenges, right? And, you know, you kind of solve a few of them for them and then suddenly they're like, hey, do you want to come and work here? Um, and that was kind of, you know, how it happened. And fortunately enough for me, those companies have raised quite a lot of money. But, I mean, you know, I lost quite a bit of money. I was... Um, I had a strategy for an interesting project called Oxygen Map. It was Oxygen Maps, which was backed by SBF, actually. And so that's, you know, run down in value significantly. Um, but, you know, I think you just have to take a view on life of saying that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, going back to what I said before, you've got to back your bets, right? It's the same thing if you go and work for a startup and they give you the magic equity prize and then you get know, your salary plus your equity. And who knows, that equity could be worth millions of dollars one day or it could be worth nothing right but yeah if you think it's a good thing to do then you do it and interesting uh interesting okay i have one question right. how if it for somebody like me this sounds a lot like a casino <laughs> and each one of these coins is a game and that game is going to either make you super rich or it's going to wipe you out Mm -hmm. why am i wrong uh, well i mean if you're not trading with leverage you shouldn't be wiped out right i mean 90 percent of leverage traders lose okay right um all right but yeah i think um it's just it's just like anything right yeah do, do your research go early i mean funny enough i said something the other day yeah if i put a thousand dollars in every project that i'd seen at seed stage yeah, in terms of first sale of token, and I'd done that. I put it. Is this pre whitelist? Is this wait? Is this pre? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. But if I if I literally put a thousand dollars in every token project that I saw, you know, day one, and just bought yeah a thousand dollars worth of token at the cheapest price, I'd have a lot more money than I've actually made out of my crypto trading. Um. So I think <laughs> I think. So it's, how do you? Sorry. How do you get to do that? Um, get close to crypto projects. I mean, that that's the All one. Right. That's the one thing I should say about this industry. A lot of people kind of, you know, get a little bit distracted. But I mean, generally speaking, like, you know, you, you take the hype out of it, and you take the crypto, and you take yeah, you know, all this noise, right? Most mm -hmm. projects start with a bunch of girls and guys somewhere working out of a bedroom with a dream. Let's be honest. Usually, and guys. Yeah. Usually, guys who don't have girls. Yeah. And I'm hoping Correct. to make enough money to speak to girls, right? Bingo. Have girls speak back. Yeah. Amy <laughs> um, Perry still wouldn't talk to me, by the way. Um, that's a Humble story. brag. I'll tell you, I will tell you that story in a minute. Actually, it was quite funny. Um, oh, but, um, but they, like, you know, it's one of those things where it's generally just like, you know, reach out to early stage founders and, you know, look at different things and find different projects. And, you know, just ask these guys a few questions. Most of them will be delighted that you asked them a question because they spend all day with no one really being that interested in what they do. And and one or two uh, of those may become big. I, I, you can ask Simon. I'm sorry to interrupt. Simon, you're nice. You're a good person to ask questions. I don't know if everybody's a good person. In in First off, this world is very... I mean, most of this world is avatars and Twitter accounts, at least in my the circles that I run in online. So it's hard to decipher whom you're actually speaking to. But secondly, man, if you find yourself talking to a Bitcoin maxi and if you uh, aren't one, uh, it's, it's, 
it's going to be rough. You're in for some rough waters. But I overall, I think your advice is good. I just think it might take more than a couple before you find your Simon. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, and hopefully you won't find me because, you know, okay. um, no, but I mean, the thing is, <laughs> no, but the, the thing is, generally, like, yeah, the Bitcoin Maxi guys, I mean, they're great, but they the world's moving beyond those guys a little bit and they don't like it. Um, it was, it was really funny. I did a, I was asked to do a talk about, um, stable coins and, uh, CBDC central bank digital currencies at BTC Miami, right? One of the fringe events. Were you at BTC was, Miami this year or last year? I was. Yeah, I okay. was, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we co-hosted the Solana stuff down in Wynwood, actually. Um, That's right. I saw but, pictures. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that was so funny because it was like, yeah, I went on after a bunch of proper Bitcoin maxis who'd been screaming about the government into microphones for 20 minutes. And obviously we started <laughs> that, you know, how you go into the real world. And it's fair to say it wasn't the right audience. Um but just, just you know, going back to the Katy Perry uh, story for a second. So I was in, um, this is going to sound very humble brag, but I'm going to do it anyway because I, I find it. No, go for it. But, so I was in, uh, I was with uh, Anatoly, the founder of Solana, who FYI is, if you get to meet him, one of the nicest, most straightforward guys in crypto, right? He's a mm-hmm. really good guy. He'll, chat, he'll walk around conferences, he'll walk around hacker houses, he'll chat to anybody. He's, he's a good guy, Tolly. And uh, we have one of those classic moments where we're at this uh, kind of VIP thing. I don't know how I got invited. They must have made a mistake on the guest list. Let's um, settle down. Yeah. And we have one of those kind of classic moments where me and Tolly went to say hi to Katy Perry because we know who she is. But Katy Perry point blank ignored us because she had no idea who we were. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It was like, hey, she just kind of looked at us and then looked away and then carried on talking to someone else. Like, Cheers, Katie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Great first impression. Yeah. 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 Although I am told that if you can find the uh, unredacted Orlando Bloom on a surfboard pictures, you can maybe understand why she's not so happy. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't, I don't know why. Okay. So I, what's the word? Uh, I don't get out much. What's, what's mm-hmm. wrong with our, what's, what's the deal with Orlando Bloom and Katy Perry? What, what what's the issue? Well, there are a couple, but there's kind of a, he did um he did a strange thing where he went surfboarding with Katy Perry on his surfboard, and he was completely naked, uh, like full frontal why naked. Why did you do that? Why uh, why I, why? I I assume he wanted attention, or or he lost a bet somewhere. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> yeah, I just don't get that that. Uh, surfing in general just seems like a very um very dangerous sport to be doing with no protection across the genital area whatsoever you're thrown into water you don't know what's under there you also have a sh- surfboard butt cheeks are open this sounds very dangerous yeah 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 and you've got you why there as well yeah why is she, I mean, so she's on the board with him yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's paddle. He's he's on the board, and they can naked with a, like a little why? paddle, and she's under the board. Yeah, yeah. But why? I I've, I I mean, I, I really hope it's a great story. Like you know, he lost a bet to Leonardo DiCaprio on who Pete Davidson was going to date next, or something. Um, but you know, that would be awesome. That would, that, that would be. I, I want to see that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see that. <laughs> I, I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a question because you've, you've, okay, you've, you've got this vision and you've got this mission uh, for your project. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, what, what makes it? What's the, what's the distinguishing factor here? Uh, like, are there other projects like it? When, why, why should I? You know, if, if I see money, I mean, if I've got an extra, you know, fifty grand lying around. Why would I put it in, in, in backs? I know that's a drop in the bucket for you, but for to us pleat commoners, right? That's that's money. So I think it's um no, I think it's, it's about multiple things, right? And I think what what's really interesting for us is that as we've built, we kind of you know, we're, we're expanding, right? So for for example, and I'll give you a really good example, is one of the key things that a lot of our clients just remember the fact that if you're, if you're looking at our protocol, it's all about attribution fee, right? That's the whole principle of it. You know, if you 
a token holder, you share in the fees, right? That we generate. Okay, that's the first mm. point. It's, okay. it's basically the same thing. At the end of the day, there has to be a real world use case for this. So every time someone goes and spends on their car, anyone who owns the token gets a, a fractional interest in what we receive from that payment. But I think the second part to that is that you look at kind of you know, the verticals that we then get into. So for example, one of the things we're going to be doing this year is bringing in a lot more trading, right? You know, derivatives and spot trading so that you Uh-oh. can, but we'll be, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be embedding those across a bunch of different platforms, you see, but we're also yes. building out our own DDID standards, decentralized digital identity, right? Because actually one of the weird things that a lot of people like Ledger have realized, and I, I go back to Ledger actually, because I think not only is Ledger. I, li- I like Ledger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like Ledger. Not only is Ledger a great business, but it's also a business that's kind of evolved, right? And you look at some of the pain points, the friction points they have. Like they're trying to make, you know, Ledger the kind of all things of everything of crypto and that, you know, you should keep your assets in your hardware wallet, which is non-custodial. Uh, and then you should be able to do all kinds of things from that. But then you hit these really real problems. Like, for example, every integration you put in, um, you have to KYC users for it, which makes it slow and clunky. You know, the whole, I've got a stick a copy of my passport, my driving bill, and my firstborn child, uh, you know, on a scan to them, right? Um, whereas, you know, someone like us, we've KYC more ledger users than anybody. So, of course, we then become the obvious people to build those uh, digital identity products because we've already verified the user, you see. So there's all kinds of layers and strands to our model where we almost kind of end up going full stack, right? And then you take, you say, you're just looking at that design philosophy of how you reduce friction. You know, it's how you get to certainty, how you get to certainty of execution. Um, and also like with our rewards products, which we're building. So there's a whole bunch of income out there, you know, which comes from a transaction, right? And it kind of starts off with the most basic thing, which is kind of card interchange, which, you know, so like America, you know, it'd be two or 3% of merchants paying a checkout, right? And mm-hmm. a chunk of that goes back to the issuer with the issuer but then there's you know affiliate income which is basically when you take a basket to a retailer online and they pay you for it or you take a you issue a certain card that uses a certain place and the retailer agrees to pay you for it as part of a marketing campaign right and traditionally they, that income very rarely makes its way back to the consumer so what we said was well look, let's disintermediate this all let's actually just give that income back to the consumer let's go and generate that so that uh, USDC. Um, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Straightforward, straightforward rewards, right? Um, but then that also means that your customer base transitions from being a customer to being an owner, right? And they become part of something, right? They become part of this network. Where they've got a little bit of real estate. And that's really the philosophy that we built with kind of how can you get to a point where you've got you know, millions of monthly active users generating income and an element of that is pool. But most importantly, it's, you know, the right of it is though, and this is the key differentiator, that is real world income that's flowing mm-hmm. through the protocol that someone else is paying for. And that someone else could be Walmart or it could be Amazon or it could be, you know, whoever, you know, wherever you can transact. Um, as opposed to kind of, you know, this idea of, you know, for example, people like Crypto.com, who just yeah, minted a token and gave it away free to people who use cards and then wondered why that model How much of sustained. that is backed? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Backed. It's about how you back so, something. Um, yeah. So why, why, why be generous? What's, what's the catch here? I'm, I'm just a plebe on the street. Why the hell are you giving me this money, man? What are you going to do to me? <laughs> Very simple. Um... Look, the simple reality is we want to, I, I, I personally don't believe, and this is, you know, philosophically me speaking here, not, not necessarily the views of my employer, I should add, um, for the regulator. <laughs> you um, are your employer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, I would say, that I, I think like if you, look at, if, you look at, if you look at a bank, right, the reason that you had a bank was because people looked for the houses to get robbed, right? So they didn't keep the money in the house, they kept it somewhere safe, right? But now in reality, you know, banks have been replaced by technology. Very few people go to a branch, very few people handle cash. Most people, it's a, it's a click or a button or a push or a number on a screen, right? And to me, a lot of the kind of, you know, the original reasons why you went to a bank become irrelevant. 
and you say, well, actually, you know what? If I can be my own bank, because I have custody of my own assets digitally, I can spend those assets where I want to spend them in a way that I'm comfortable with spending them. And I can do all kinds of different things with them. Why would that be my own? You see, the point to that is, how do I incentivize you to say, use this as one of your primaries, Mm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the answer to that, of course, is you've got to give the user the benefit of becoming self custody, because self custodian, right? So if you think about the model, right? In reality, it's like saying, "Hey, Baz, you're your own bank. You're going to this retailer, and because you chose to be your own bank and you chose to go to this retailer, you're getting something back that you wouldn't have got had you gone with your own bank or your traditional mm-hmm. bank." Mm-hmm. And, and and blockchain makes that possible. You know, we, we said kind of in the early days of how we designed, we, we looked at kind of you know, how you incentivize switching, right? And you think, well, most people have already got a cashback card. And they don't really care about them because yep. 1% back $3 doesn't change many people. Okay. It doesn't change lives, right? Most people have already got an Amex card, which is a good example, actually, of what skin works because you can do stuff with the points, right? If they, you know, that's that. interesting. This is really but, interesting. But in reality, you know, Beyond that, how do you kind of create a more rewarding user journey using technology? So one of the earliest use cases we looked at was kind of, let's say that yeah, Baz and Derek walk into the Nike store and they both go and buy a... That Jordan would never happen. Nike. But yes, right. yeah. <laughs> they, both go, they both go and buy a yeah, Jordan 92 collection item, right? Sure. Now, you see, the, the thing is, if you, you pay for that traditional instrument, no one knows... Nike don't actually know who you are unless you choose to leave your details, right? So let's say you've got two people that check out next to each other, one with a non-custodial wallet and one without, one with a traditional account. What we wanted to create was this kind of view of, hey, you could get an airdrop of something at checkout that was meaningful to you, right? As you, because you chose that non-custodial wallet. So let's say, for example, you shop in, I don't know, pick a store from me, your favorite clothing store, Baz. Bro, I'm an uh, Old Navy. I'm an engineer. <laughs> Nailed it. I'm an I'm an engineer. I dress like a homeless man. I was once not let into my own building because the uh, doorman didn't believe I lived there. So just to give you an idea of where I, how I dress. So okay. uh, uh, let's let's go with uh, how about this? Uh, my favorite. Uh, what do I buy? Let's say video. I, I don't even buy video games. What do I buy? Uh, my favorite health foods health food store health food yeah. store. All right. There you go. Okay. So let's say that, for example, you know, you go to this health food store every day for a year, right? And actually, you're your regular customer. Now, if I know that, and I can find that by reading the data under your wallet, I don't have to take your personal information for that, right? There's no reason why I can't identify you as someone who goes there all the time. And say, for example, you go to check out, you swipe your car, you, yeah. Interesting. And actually, it's free. Because you know what? You use this product enough. I've got an algorithm. I've worked out you've generated some income. You know, your checkout's free because you're a regular customer. But, you know, it's those kind of experiences where you look at it and say, hang on, you know, you've got a little notification pop up on your phone. This one's on us. Thank you. (laughs) Right. That's great. And and that's kind of actually cool. Yeah, I'd like that. You know what I mean? Because you wouldn't get that experience with a traditional finance business, right? They just can't. You you wouldn't even get. I mean, I mean you, right. you you wouldn't even get that with industries adjacent to. I mean, I like I was thinking, is this lolly? Is this different from? And now it's like, okay, no, this is a this is kind of like, it's it's that sphere, but it's very different. Um, so that's interesting because yeah. that that's what it was bothering me at the beginning. I was like, what's 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 the what differentiates this? And you got to it. So yeah, yeah. now I've seen. So how do you set up? Go, how do you set up a non custodial wallet? I mean. Baz, should that one? Or should I? Uh, non custodial wallet. Uh, buy, buy a ledger. Uh, buy yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, just buy a ledger. I mean, I could show you uh, how to do it. It's really, I mean, go to Amazon.com. I mean, these things have gotten, like, let me l- look right now, real quick. How much? Uh, okay, non custodial well, wallet. I guess I was going to ask, like, uh, so use this, uh, you sign up with the thing you're talking about. If I go to a bank, normally, if I set an uh, open account, then they hand me the checkbook or they yeah. they hand me the the card. Yeah. Uh, do you guys do something like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually, or, you can, yeah. Oh. So we can, 
we could, if you look at like Ledger CL, which I admit isn't live in the US yet, so you'll struggle to see it, but I can actually issue you a virtual card as you sign up that you can link to Apple Pay or Google Pay immediately. And you can use the card within minutes. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes it really convenient for me. Yeah. Because. Uh, so what we normally do is we issue a virtual card and then we send you a physical version of the virtual card later through the post. But yeah, oh, that's, that's smart. You're sm you really were in fintech. Yeah, that is a fintech <laughs> move. No, that's a fintech yeah. move. That's smart. Yeah. So when are you hiring? Uh, I'm just kidding. Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> everyone's, everyone's welcome. Uh, just just turn up. Um, no, we are we are hiring at the moment. We just actually hired some guys in from Kodelsky. Um, on the blockchain side. Wow. Um, but at the moment, we're mainly working on the kind of mid layer of how we build the kind of machine logic right. around this so that we can right. kind of start to say, so we're reading real data at the moment to better inform our algos, right? Uh, but what we're really looking at is kind of patterns, trying to identify patterns so that, you know, how do I identify the fact that you might support a particular sports team or drink a certain drink or whatever, right? So there's a bit um, of AI here, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, or that's at least the next predictive phase. analysis. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're using predictive analysis now, and then we're trying to move that towards more AI. But I think we'll probably do the AI piece quite slowly because there's a kind of significant danger that I end up kind of airdropping it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't want to airdrop you kind of NFT for ladies' underwear and get you in trouble with your wife <laughs> if she ever changed your phone. Um, or kind of yeah, making sure that I'm not giving girls kind of you know boys football right. boots as, right. a, as a reward. Right, right. Um, so, but yeah, the same. So, uh, so, yeah. I want to continue this conversation, but I have to go. I have to go soon. But I did have one last question, and I wish I could continue this conversation because it is really, really interesting uh, mm -hmm. uh, to crypto nerds. Uh, Derek, yeah. that was hilarious. Are there any projects uh, you're thinking about? Uh, at least when it comes to you, the use of crypto, uh, like, I don't know, like having a digital wallet or something like, are there, are there projects that kind of have more tangible, uh, qualities that might be more apparent to the day-to-day -day user? You know what I mean? Yeah. See, the one I really like at the moment actually, uh, is a company called Squirrel Wallet, right? So what they've done is they've done away with seed phrases. Now, seed phrases, as people don't know, when you download a non-custodial wallet, you often get this list of kind of 15 different words that you have to right. remember to uh, take care of, right? Uh, and most people lose them. And then when they download a new phone, they lose their wallet, right? Uh, so they've replaced it with guardians so that you can actually have three or four people who can validate you as you. And they've also yeah. built what's kind of an automated cross-chain wallet. So effectively what that means, and I'm talking in layman's terms here, what that means really is that if you send money to the wrong blockchain, which is a classic thing, if you try to send BNB to Ethereum, they lose it. So they've actually worked out a system where you can effectively stop that happening. Um, That's and amazing. really cool functionality underneath that. Yeah, so it's called Squirrel Wallet. I really like that. And the I think their token is kind of, you know, in private sales, which maybe gains public sale one soon. So I keep an eye on that. Yeah. And just to explain to you, uh, to anyone who's, who's, who's listening, like that's a big problem. People do that all the time. People send their Ethereum to uh, like a Bitcoin address. And when that happens, it's done. You don't get that money back. Let's say you sent a quarter million in, in, in Ethereum to a Bitcoin address. You don't get that money back. But if this actually, that, yeah, go on. That's my favorite thing about, um, okay. So in the real world, I send it to the wrong address. It still exists someplace. Right. But with computers, they send it, they say it's, it was sent here and there is nothing there. Right. And now it is gone. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it went into the nothing. That's actually a good question. I don't know because I'm gonna have to. Maybe we'll get Mahmoud on here. He's a crypto. He's a cryptography specialist at Amazon, um, and he can explain. He breaks codes. He has like four patents on him, and he is. Uh, he graduated from Princeton when he was 15, so he. Okay. But he's also very fun. Th thank you so much. We're gonna have to do a part two, uh, just because I, okay. I'm really fascinated by your business. Uh, but I also know you're insanely busy, busy uh, but we'll figure something out. 
Uh, and uh, no, thank you so much for, for, for joining us and answering some of these questions and uh, actually getting into the technical details because most people um, don't like to do that. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, when they get pressed on it, uh, they, you know, they just, uh, they get upset. So I appreciate your patience with us on that one. No, absolutely. That, um, it's, yeah, it's always good. I might actually be in the same city as you may or may not be in uh, the first week of March, actually. So maybe we could do Does it. Does it rhyme with Schmalumbia? Does it remind, remind, does it rhyme with Schmalumbia? Might be too far yeah. from there. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Let's do it, man. Right. Let's keep in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Lovely to meet you, Derek. Yeah. By the way, yeah. That, go on. Awesome to meet you. Thanks for the info. Do you want people? Okay. Nah, you don't. You want to keep? I know how you are. You're secretive. We're not gonna. We'll just say, si if you want to check out Simon's work, go to what's the website, Simon? Um, that's <laughs> probably is uh, just type in Ledger CL cards into Google. That's the okay. best one. Uh, that's and check the out the banks. Check check out banks the banks or, medium. It, it's pretty good actually. It explains a lot of their stuff. Yeah. Or banks. dot so. com, but. Yeah, banks are comes more of a kind of B two B side, but yeah, for the retail side, look at look at Ledger CL or Tezos CL. Um, yeah, uh, C for Columbia, L for Ledger, um, which are you know, two of our consumer facing sites. Um, and yeah, good luck. Thanks. Very uh, much, you'll guys. hear. Thanks so much, buddy. You'll hear from me soon, and uh, wishing you no nothing but love and success. And it's been awesome watching watching your journey from afar. <laughs>